All right, welcome to the Return to Freud. In this Return to Freud, we're gonna be covering two papers, one from 1916 um, on transience and one from 1917, a very famous paper on mourning and melancholia. Um, they're both fundamentally connected to each other, which is why I wanted to tackle them together. Um, and I think that there's a nice logical train here of ideas uh, in the two papers and also continuing roughly our theme at this section of the Return to Freud, um, this is a period in Freud's life where he is writing during World War I. World War I is having an enormous impact on Freud's ideas. Um, Freud is capable of thinking about things from a psychoanalytic point of view that are in some sense being stimulated by the external world around him. Um, the fact that Europe was deeply embroiled in, in of course, one of the most brutal conflicts uh, in the modern world. And I think it changed a lot of people's perspective on life, humanity, and, 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 and enlightenment values. Um, and Freud is, is offering here, I think, oftentimes not only psychoanalytic perspective, but also becoming more philosophical, uh, offering more philosophical interpretations on the meaning of life and death, on, on war and death, like we covered in a previous workshop. And uh, specifically, I think in the first paper we're going to be looking at titled On Transients, um, this uh, this uh, puts Freud, I think, deeper and deeper into philosophical territory. So let me share my screen. First paper on transience. And again, this is from, from 1916. Uh, before starting, I just wanna let you know that you can find a link in the description to uh, my Patreon, which is a great way to stay in touch. It's a great way to support online creation. Uh, you can also find a link in the description to philosophyportal.online, which is a new platform I've developed trying to offer courses of the greatest philosophical thinkers. Um, I'm going to be trying to offer uh, many courses or at least two courses uh, every year. So check that out if you're interested in learning more about philosophy. And there's also a link in the description to my PhD thesis, Global Brain Singularity, which is basically a meditation on subjectivity and temporality in the 21st century. Now getting into the paper itself on transience. So Freud retells a story of his, uh, a day with a young famous poet uh, where they were walking in nature. And he is basically describing that this poet was disturbed, uh, in, inwardly disturbed at his own capacity to enjoy the scenery, to enjoy nature. Uh, although he thought it was beautiful, he also thought it was doomed to basically transients, that, that it would pass, that it would come to pass. And this disturbed his capacity to enjoy. Um, Freud reflects that the poet's response to transients is one of an aching despondency, which is one of two common responses to transients of all things. The other one being a rebellion against the facts of things. In other words, the, a great no to transients, that there is something eternal, something mysteriously eternal about reality that we just don't understand yet. This might um, capture in some ways the roots, the psychological roots of, let's say, nihilism and religious belief. Uh, religious belief, of course, is a rebellion against transients, an assertion of an eternal principle, whereas the aching despondency is kind of like a nihilistic despair, a feeling like I cannot enjoy a feeling like I cannot enjoy the beauty of the world because it will just pass over and into nothingness. Uh, Freud suggests that speculative thought of the unconscious wish fundamentally revolts against transients. Uh, however, that this does not um, necessarily tell us anything about the truth of things in themselves. Um, he, says, he says, the unconscious somehow or other thinks that this loveliness must be able to persist and escape the power of destruction. Um, now that raises an interesting question. Um, I, think it, I think it does bring us to philosophical topics, which we might want to explore with um, Lacan or Zizek's work uh, on immortality. But in any case, what he's basically setting up here is a dichotomy between um, temporality of reality and this unconscious wish. He first suggests that what is painful may be true, namely that what is beautiful and perfect may be lost forever. 
Um, however, this may not decrease, but rather increase its worth. Um, this is a nice meme here that says, when you know you'll never, just a second. Uh, this is a nice meme here that says, when you know you'll never see it again, look how beautiful it becomes. And this is basically the viewpoint that Freud is trying to communicate here, that somehow the limitation of a thing, the, tempor the temporal limitation of a thing, uh, increases the capacity to enjoy, uh, potentially, uh, not decreasing it. Um, and so in some sense, Freud's saying here that the capacity to enjoy beauty does not need to be at odds with a truthful view of reality. Um, but it may also involve a confrontation with something painful, namely some attachment to reality, um, which was um, uh, unnecessary and unjustified in some sense. Uh, ultimately, here, the idea he proposes is that limitation in the, in the possibility of enjoyment raises the value of enjoyment, i.e. its scarcity value. I think that this, I think this is worth reflecting on for the, for the simple fact that Today, we are living in a world of abundance. We're living in a world where things um, are much more abundant than they were at any other time in human history. And that the, the challenge for us now often is scarcity, um, is, is limitation. Uh, and Freud's saying that this is crucially linked to our, not pleasure, which might be more linked to abundance, but enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So the human face he gives as an example of um, an example of, of beauty that is subjected to transience, also a blooming flower, a work of art, an intellectual achievement, and claims that none of these things lose their worth by temporal limitation. In other words, just because a beautiful face is destined to grow old, that doesn't mean that it is valueless. That doesn't mean that it has no value. On the contrary, I think Freud would say that that very limitation gives it its value. The fact that it is temporal is why it's valuable. So he then goes into the question of how does temporal limitation spoil enjoyment? His hypothesis is that there's a mental revolt against mourning, the, what he calls the work of mourning or the process of mourning. Um, and that this work of mourning or this process of mourning, which does involve a sensitivity, a heightened sensitivity, um, which may be why, for example, a young poet uh, may be particular susceptible to the work of mourning and the process of mourning. Um, uh, and he says that this work of mourning involves an instinctive revolt against pain, a feeling that the enjoyment of beauty has been interfered with by transients. But he, he, he wants to go deeper into what is this work of mourning and, and how can psychoanalysis offer us some deeper uh, interpretation of, of mourning. He says, mourning over loss as what, have, what has been loved or admired seems natural to the layman uh, and even regarded as self-evident. But for psychology, mourning is a great riddle. Um, and psychoanalysis here basically gives us a model of mourning. Uh, psychoanalysis starts with the idea that we have a limited capacity for love, that is our libido, our sexual energy, um, and that the early mind first attaches to the ego and then secondarily to objects in the world. And mourning is specifically the process of libidinal detachment from attachment. So if you're unconscious attached to the beauty, so in the case of the young poet, if your libido, your sexual energy attaches to the beauty of the world um, unconsciously, and then upon later intellectual development, you come to find out let's say some thermodynamic principles or um, you know, simply the, the phenomenon of entropy, um, uh, the theory of the heat death of the universe. Um, these ideas, these theoretical abstractions and this recognition that nature will eventually fall away, that the earth is not going to last forever. Uh, this will cause some sort of process of mourning to happen um, that that or even reflecting on one's own death um, may cause a process of mourning because all of the things your ego attached to um, are going to fall away. 
Now, again, Freud is here thinking in the process of World War I, where he's basically saying that our entire civilization is in a process of mourning, that many things that we thought to be eternal, many of the things we unconsciously assume to be unchanging have changed. Um, our pride has been shattered. Our achievements have been lost. The beauty of our civilization and our artists and our philosophers have all been, have all been lost. Um, World War I has revealed the impartiality of science, the nakedness of our instincts, and let loose evil spirits. Um, all of this dramatically shattered the image of the European um, in, in 1916, and he gives that uh, example as a, an example of the European mind undergoing a process of mourning on a, on a, on a social level, on a, on a collective level. Um, uh, we already covered this in great detail uh, in the um, workshop on war and death. So I recommend anyone who hasn't checked that out to check that out. Um, and, and finally, he just, he just furthermore reflects on how the society as a whole is going through a process of uh, ephemerality, a recognition of ephemerality, that, 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 that things that were unconsciously attached to um, are now completely different and destroyed. And that this is a, this is a, a perhaps the, the important context in which to understand even the very appearance of this paper and Freud's reflections on this topic. So he specifically says that World War I has stripped our libido of all its objects, all its attachments, recoiling to what little we have left. Um, that the state of mourning introduces this um, making permanent of renunciation because we have we have because something precious was lost. So this is a state of mourning that when we attach to something precious and then we lose it, um, this is when mourning commences uh, its renunciation of all objects that uh, it, 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 it won't attach to precisely because of their temporality, that it cannot enjoy the temporality anymore. And, and it reveals that there was an unconscious attachment which was under a presupposition of eternity. Um, mourning itself comes to an end, however, and it frees libido up again. And this is, I think, where, what Freud is pointing towards. And I think this is what Freud is, is suggesting is his internal difference in relationship to the young poet, um, that he, perhaps Freud has undergone the work of mourning as it relates to the loss of nature. Um, perhaps Freud has done the work of mourning and has freed his libido up again to enjoy the world, even, even though it is, is temporal, even though it is limited. Um, and he suggests that our entire civilization, of course, he's talking about Europe in the, the 19, 19, 1916. He's saying after the war, we, we, we may again build again our civilization that is still more precious, even if we know of its fragility. Um, so he's saying here that this principle of mourning on an individual level can also be applied to the civilizational level. And I think that um, not only does he stand correct uh, after all these years, of course, it's 2022 now, um, but we have undergone many conflicts, uh, World War II, the Cold Wars, atomic warfare, um, and we still build civilization and we still find it precious um, and we still uh, are engaged in that ongoing work of world building and, and, and the formation of the image of our, of our common humanity. Um, is something that still goes on. It still persists, even despite all of these uh, catastrophes, even despite the fact that we know ultimately we will uh, lose everything. So that brings us to mourning and melancholia. And I hope that that sets the scene for this paper, because um, while the first paper really focuses on mourning, um, Freud here uses this reflection on mourning to make some really precise um, clinical uh, diagnoses of the difference between mourning and melancholia. And there's a very important minimal distinction that he introduces. Um, of course, here with mourning, we're, we're talking about the loss of external objects that the unconscious was attached to. In melancholia, something different is at work. And uh, that's what I would like to uh, highlight in this overview of the very famous paper from 1917. So there's a correlation of melancholia and mourning, which seems justified by the general picture of the two conditions, namely that there's many similarities. Uh, first, he um, highlights the environmental influences, which seem to be the same for both conditions in the sense, the loss of a loved person or an abstraction, a country, a liberty or an ideal. 
Uh, in the previous paper, of course, we covered that not only with the individual poet who has lost the ideal of nature, but also the European society that has lost its ideal of common humanity, uh, which opened up a process of mourning. Um, the interesting starting point for his distinction between mourning and melancholia is that spontaneously among common humanity, we never view mourning as a pathological condition in need of medical treatment, but simply rely on it as being overcome after a certain lapse of time. So Freud himself pointed towards this in the last paper as it related to time, simply saying that after a certain amount of time, people overcome their mourning, they overcome the, grieve, uh, the grief of the lost object, um, and their libido is once again freed up to attach again and to love again and to uh, live again. However, with melancholia, we often view it as with a more pathological dimension. So he goes into some of the clinical descriptions or, or symptoms of melancholia. First, a profound painful dejection, a cessation of interest in, outside, in the outside world, a loss of the capacity to love, an inhibition of all activity, a lowering of uh, self-regard, um, self-reproaches and reviling, self-reviling, uh, and culminates in a delusional expectation of punishment. Um, he then compares melancholia to mourning and says that it's almost the same as melancholia, except that in mourning, there's no disturbance of a lowered self-regard, a self-reproach or a self-reviling. So this distinction is one I want to highlight and, and one I want, uh, well, one I think that is, is important to understand Freud's paper here is that he's saying in melancholia, this lowering of self-regard and this appearance of self-reproaches and self-revile is what distinguishes melancholia from mourning. So the work of mourning uh, basically commences when reality testing, quote unquote, shows the loved object does not exist. For example, uh, the loss of European civilization in the context of World War I uh, and demands a painful withdrawal of libido. However, the work of melancholia, losses of a more ideal kind, he suggests, suggests um, not necessarily death, but loss, uh, not necessarily the loss of a, a love object, but sorry, I'm, I think I messed up this line. Not necessarily death, but loss of love object where there is more unconscious. Uh, he's basically saying that there is more unconscious about what has been lost. In other words, the melancholic does not really understand as well as the person mourning does about what he or she has lost. Whereas the person mourning might say directly, I'm mourning the loss of my image of nature as eternal, or I'm mourning the loss of a loved one. I'm mourning the loss of a partner. I'm mourning the loss of, of, of peaceful civil life. Uh, the melancholic is, is, is unsure of what they have lost. Uh, it is harder to know what, what, what has been lost, uh, specifically um, the ego's libidinal concentration uh, in comparison to mourning. Uh, and in this regard, uh, Freud further explores this distinction as, as the clue to melancholia um, is the grand impoverishment of self-character. In other words, someone who's mourning may feel as though reality is empty, but someone who's melancholic will feel that their very own being is empty. And that's the crucial distinction here. So again, uh, just to reiterate this point, the mourning subject believes the world is empty. The melancholic subject believes the self or the ego is empty. The melancholic will represent their own being as worthless, incapable, morally despicable, vilified and punishable. There's a delusional notion of inferiority which extends back over the past. Uh, the subject becomes sleepless, refuses nourishment. And Freud says this is actually one of the most interesting things about the melancholic, which is that there's an overcoming of all instincts, uh, compelling uh, the clinging to life. In other words, Freud suggests here that the melancholic is is in a state of being, a state of void, a state of emptiness, uh, which allows it to reject all of its natural instincts and its, its natural libidinal uh, proclivities. 
Um, and I think this is extremely fascinating. And, and I, I myself have some relationship to this state of, of melancholia and this sort of feeling of the emptiness of the self. And, and, and I wonder sometimes how much of um, my own experimentation with fasting, for example, had this uh, drive in it to overcome my instincts and to, um, to, to go against myself, to, to revile myself. I think this is, this is something interesting to reflect on. The key to mel melancholic self-reproaches are approaches against a loved object which has been shifted away from it and to the patient's own ego. So what's crucial here is that if you remember the psychoanalytic model I introduced in the previous paper where first the libido attaches to the ego, we have limited love, first it attaches to the ego, then second, secondarily it attaches to the world. Um, and so the melancholic is, is suffering with a deeper sense of loss than the person who's mourning. Whereas the person who's mourning is simply mourning the external object. The person in melancholia is uh, shifted this very object into its own ego. Uh, so there's an object attachment that had existed, was shattered just like the person in mourning. However, the result Freud says is abnormal, namely that the freed libido has attached to the ego. And this feeling of loss is then attached to the very self itself. And this is why there's an unconscious dimension to melancholia, which is of a different nature than that of mourning. Um, so the, the, the libidinal attachment had established an identification with the ego as, as an abandoned object. It was like the shadow of the object fell on the ego. So in, in, in the situation of the mourner, the poet who is mourning nature, there was a shadow that had fought, fallen over nature itself. Whereas for the melancholic, a shadow has fallen on the ego, just to re-emphasize this point that object loss turns into ego loss. And now you might think that this is of interesting spiritual significance, uh, maybe perhaps in the Buddhist tradition where there is this emphasis on not only the Buddhist tradition, of course, but in this spiritual tendency to emphasize the loss of the ego in this tendency to go against the ego, to, to, to want to get rid of the self. Um, this, this motion appears in many spiritual traditions. So, but here Freud is, is, is approaching it from a clinical standpoint. So the precondition for melancholia is first, there would have to be a extremely strong object fixation, which must have been present. And the object concentrations had little resistance uh, to overcome this power. So you, you attach very, it's, it's exactly like, like, um, you know, Golem, uh, in Lord of the Rings attaching to the ring of power and, and fixating on it and, and being unable to overcome it, becoming weak in re relationship to it has, has no power over himself, but to attach onto this object. So the melancholia borrows from mourning, but also from the process of regression to narcissism, namely the ego attachment. So you can see here, as is um, typical in Freud's writings during this decade, is that he's starting to push to other sim psychic symptoms, which are not related to the transference neuroses, but also to narcissism. And he would put melancholia closer to the melancholic because it's not a transference as it relates to the object, but a transference which relates to its, his, own, his or her own ego. Um, like mourning, they react to real loss of the loved object, but marked by a pathological dimension, an egoic attachment, which is absent in normal mourning. So um, I think kind of like Golem that um, the melancholic doesn't only miss the lost object, but starts to hate themselves, is cannot put up with themselves. So if love for the object takes refuge, refuge in the narcissistic identity, hate comes into operation on the substitute of object. In other words, the most common example would be if someone um, fixates strongly in an intimate relationship and then loses their partner, uh, and becomes melancholic over this loss, the subject that they, or the object basically, that the subject substitutes for this loss um, could potentially become an object of deep hate. Uh, he says, 
hate comes into operation on the substitutive object because basically at this point, the melancholic subject believes that they'll never really get their true object back or they'll never get their ideal object back. And so the substitutive object becomes subjected to abuse, debasement, suffering, and a, uh, a source of sadistic satisfaction. The melancholic self-torture uh, is without a doubt enjoyable, Freud says, um, and that it takes revenge on the original object, tormenting it through its own illness instead of expressing hostility openly. So instead of simply being honest with, instead of the melancholic subject being honest with him or herself about what's really going on in terms of unconscious motivation, um, the melancholic starts to enjoy its own self-torture and also to um, externalize this torture on the objects which can never really satisfy it, uh, never really um, replace that original enjoyment that was um, was satisfied perhaps in the in this example, intimate partner relationship or um, could be in many other contexts, of course. But uh, in the case of psychoanalysis, I think it's important to zero in on this on this uh, intimate dimension. Uh, so sadism emerges to uh, solve uh, solve the riddle of the tendency to suicide, which makes melancholia, which Freud says makes melancholia so interesting and dangerous, namely that um, the sadistic enjoyment, or and perhaps we could also link uh, masochism here uh, in some way, is the form of enjoyment which the melancholic starts to use um, to... to um, replace that original enjoyment or that original satisfaction. It's, in other words, as we've covered in a previous um, workshop on the vicissitudes of the instincts, uh, sadism, sadism and masochism are um, forms of enjoyment that emerge in the inversion of pleasure and pain. Um, Freud says that the ego self-love is a primal state from which instinctual life proceeds and is hard to conceive of its own destruction. So here Freud's reflecting on how it is that a state of being could emerge where um, ultimately the subject would destroy itself. Um, and, and, and this is linked back to Freud's astonishment at the melancholic at overcoming its own uh, life drive tendencies. So I think this paper is really important because you start to see how Freud's thinking is already pushing towards the, the ability to think the death drive. He's already starting to see that the life drive is not uh, as um, complete and as ineradicable as he originally thought, that eros uh, and the love that comes from the libido has to contend with a, another darker force, uh, which can potentially lead to self-destruction. Um, he says, the melancholic shows that the ego can kill itself, however, only if it can treat itself as an object originally in the external world. So again, this casting of a shadow uh, from the object onto the ego itself. So this is extremely fascinating. Of the two opposed situations that come into play in the creation of the most extreme melancholic, that is, this total infatuation with love and then this total suicidal drive that the ego is overwhelmed by the object, but in different ways. In the situation of love, the ego is overwhelmed by the external object, which is basically the ground for the transference neuroses. In the suicidal, law, suicidal destruction, the ego is overwhelmed by the impossibility of the inner object. Um, in melancholia and mourning, they both share the feature of passing without leaving any traces, which is good news. In both situations, mourning and melancholia do uh, heal themselves or the possibility of, uh, of, of recovery is there. Uh, and libido can be freed again from loss. Um, what is basically at issue here is loss. What is basically at issue here is limitation and coming to terms with loss and limitation. Uh, the mystery of melancholia is that it is that there are periods of mania and Freud here, I don't know if he formulates a final understanding of mania, but he forwards a hypothesis that both the melancholic and the manic are wrestling with the same complex. In one form, the ego succumbs to the complex of loss and in mania, the ego masters this complex and goes 
goes, uh, I mean, goes manic, goes, ex gets into an extremely excited or hyperactive state. So I think this is the final slide. Um, here to conclude by taking flight, and this is a very interesting, and I think the, yeah, it's, it's one of the most interesting ways to understand why melancholic is a, uh, melancholia is a good thing in some sense, is that by taking flight from the object to the ego, the melancholic state helps the subject to keep love from extinction. Uh, in other words, melancholia has a preservation of love uh, at its core. Um, the subject is basically struggling with its capacity to love in the world. And melancholia is, you could say, like a last resort, um, a last resort to keep love from becoming extinct. Um, he says the process of melancholia extinguishes itself uh, basically when the fury of it has been spent or after the object that has been abandoned uh, is, is seen as valueless or has been abandoned as valueless. So basically, I think that there's a lot of reason here to suspect that the, the melancholic simply needs to work through honestly its anger work through honestly its violence um, and, and, and exhaust, exhaust the whole process um, so that it can then once again regain contact with a, with a, a love for life or a, a zest for life. And he does offer one final thought on mania, which is that it's made possible by the freed libidinal energy. So you get a sense here that why melancholia and mania oscillate between each other in this stage, because um, the freed libidinal energy of the melancholic is coming up, and that, that's, that's to, to explain the appearance of mania, uh, which can then be used narcissistically, which seems to require assistance beyond analysis. So again, here Freud is pointing towards certain states of mind, uh, not just schizophrenia, not just uh, narcissism, but also uh, mania. Um, which seem to require um, methods of um, engagement or treatment, which is beyond the capacities of analysis to, to help. So I think that's the end. So I'll just uh, remind the viewers that there's links in the description to the Patreon philosophy portal and Global Brain Singularity, if you're interested in those. And uh, I will open it up now to conversation. Thanks for your, your attention. And um, who wants to get started, Mika? Oh yeah, I would like to start if possible, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, okay, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, I would like to start by making a brief like request, if that's possible. Sure. Uh, I would like to us to perhaps focus more on um, the latter paper on mourning and melancholia, since it's far more interesting, I think. And then another uh, request would be that if, if possible, uh, uh, we could go like a round, open round, where each would each participant would uh, tell if they read the text, uh, what they made of it, and what's the key takeaway in, in short. Uh, terms if possible well we'll see we'll we'll see who's who's open for that i i mean i the, yeah the, the, i'd like the, to hear more opin opinions about the how, how the text affected the readers here but I'll try i, to I can a, start if possible yeah please start and i'll, I'll try to make a yeah. point to i'll try to make a point to encourage everyone here to offer a perspective yeah so it's a really crisp essay and Freud is so tentative a writer that it's so amazing how he works through this issue. And uh, I'd like to also point out that he basically starts with a problem that he encounters in his own clinical practice. And these are not as established terms at his time. And he's really working with the material that he has encountered and, and what does he see in the pra practice of psychoanalysis? So he starts from a problem, but he also gets to a solution in the end. He gives a three three point like uh, way that melancholia has to work. 
three kind of like uh, predispositions for melancholian. He says that it's mainly a regression of uh, libido to the ego. It's he says that it's a regressive mode in the end. Um, and when we approach the text of mourning and melancholia from today, what we might first observe is the lack of a more common term, which would be used globally today in psychology, namely depression. Depression is the term that has historically taken the place that earlier mourning and melancholia had in psychiatry, basically. Uh, Lider, Darian Lider makes a great point about this in his book on uh, mourning, melancholia and depression called The New Black, which I recommend highly for anybody who is interested in the issue. But there he basically argues that the movement towards uh, a more vague term of depression has been, it hasn't been a good uh, development to say the least, it's and depression is just a vague term, as I said, for many great variety of different states. It's a descriptive term at best used by popular psychology and even psychoanalysis and everything. But we should appreciate Freud because Freud gives a precise concept here. It's not a vague concept that he is just tossing around for describing different things. He gives a structural account of how this works, he thinks. And I think it's, it's, it's as Daria Leiter points out, it's quite sad that we have lost this precision that Freud gives here in, in today's, today's discussions about depression and so on. For me, it was quite enlightening reading. And I think that the perhaps the most interesting thing that Freud did was locate or identify a state of mania for melancholia as an essential part of it. It was kind of like an interesting and but ingenious move to see that what's what's at stake in, in melancholia. And perhaps it also would make sense if we think of melancholia in terms of psychosis rather than neurosis as Freud seems to do here. It's ex especially the uh, modern Lacanian reading of melancholia would be located as a psychosis rather. And maybe it would be a good way to explain this difference of psychosis and neurosis. Uh, just to point out that whereas in psychosis, uh, there is a certainty of certain kinds of like, it's, it's it's kind of like a nice situation in a way, since as you said, it's there is certain happiness in melancholia of being able to locate the answer, the cause, that self is the reason of misery. The ego is deplored as this kind of like miserable thing. The ego is uh, criticized with harsh terms. The ego lacks, the ego is this, the ego is that. So the psychotic has a definite answer where in neurosis, there is just a question. So there's this basic distinction between states or structures where in neurosis, there is a question in, in hysteria, the question concerning about sexuality, am I a man or a woman? And what does it mean to be a man or a woman? But in psychosis, there is just a certainty here. And he's seeing also the connection between obsessional neurosis and uh, melancholia, the self-reproaches. And in obsessional neurosis, the question would be that, am I alive or am I a dead person? What does it mean to, for me to be alive and so on? So these were kind of a few takeaway points at the... But by the way, I would like to add that I didn't like your uh, uh, connection to Gollum in, in Lord of the Rings. I don't think it works because Gollum isn't melancholic. Gollum is, is something else, since it's a different issue to uh, be a melancholic and have lost something in the object than to have the answer in the object. And Gollum certainly has the answer. It's the ring. That's the whole point of loving the ring. Well, certainly he mourns the loss of the ring. 
Yeah, but it's and, uh, it's an answer within the object, and not in yeah, the yeah. ego. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I take the criticism's fair point. The logic, the logic I had in my mind was clearly there's a there's a process of mourning with the object, but there's also this um, persistent self hatred in his speech. Like he he he's he he attacks himself in his own speech. Like he and he has this this inner monologue. This inner. Any case, it's not it's not a point. I take mm, your point. Yeah, yeah. It's, anyway, it's, it's, I, I could be, I could be totally wrong. Yeah, I, I could say. be totally wrong. Well, well, the melancholy can have these objects of uh, losing the freedom or losing the fatherland and so on, as Freud points out. But yeah, I think the cru the crucial thing is that, as you already said, that there's this precondition for melancholia, which does involve this hyper fixation on, on an object. And, it, you know, like Freud says, on the one hand, there's this totalizing love. And on the other hand, there's this totalizing suicide, um, which which he, you know, he brings up as potentially the most interesting thing about melancholia. And, and I think that here may, may, may be another yeah. source of uh, like disagreement it, when you are emphasizing some kind of fixation on an object. Freud says that there must have been a strong fixation of an object, but he doesn't say that there is a strong fixation on an object in melancholia. That's that's not the issue for melancholy. That's another issue. What is at stake in melancholia is ultimately the work of melancholia. That's another point to stress. Okay. We can we can go on that. Eric has his his hand raised, and then if any anyone else who wants to speak, just raise your hand, and I'll get to you. So Eric first. Great. Thank you, Fidel, for a <clears throat> wonderful lecture and this opportunity to talk about something I think <clears throat> uh, has probably touched all of us in one way or another. We all either ourselves or uh, family and friends, loved ones who have struggled with um, depression or I, um, manic depression, bipolar disorders, things like that. And so this is a very um, germane topic to be dealing with. I want to pick up a little bit on something that Mika talked about, and, and I <clears throat> wrote about it a little bit in, in our, our conversation before uh, we came on in the, uh, the Freudian Unconscious Facebook group. So if people want to go and, and, and look at that conversation. Um, and it, and it has to do with what Mika talked about in regard to psychosis, where in psychosis, according to the Lacanian understanding, there's a foreclosure of the symbolic. Um, of, and um, what I think may be going on here in terms of, of how we understand the difference between um, melancholia and mourning specifically has to do with the object relation. Uh, and it, it has, I think, it's a, sim it's a similar phenomenon to psychosis. But the way that I was beginning to think about it, and this is entirely speculative and, um, it, you know, so I'm, I'm open to criticism here. Um, but whereas psychosis is a foreclosure of the symbolic, I, I, I want to see mel uh, melancholia as a foreclosure of the real in terms of das Ding, the, the thing. And, and let me kind of set this up so maybe it makes a, a bit more sense. Uh, and it goes to something that Lacan deals with at the very end, the last paragraph of his last full seminar, Seminar 25, where he, he states that really what's at stake in psychoanalysis is this relation between the real and the, and the, and the imaginary in terms of what comes between them, what, what, what mediates the real to the, the imaginary, which is the symbolic. But I think when we, when we look at um, melancholia or what we would call today depression, we don't necessarily see a foreclosure of the symbolic. In fact, I think we, we, we live in a, in, in a world full of symbolic object relations. Uh, but what is foreclosed is the thing itself, das Ding, this zero level of desire that is located in the real, this beyond of the signified 
this, um, uh, you know, the mother, the, the breast, that was the initial uh, cause of desire, that <clears throat> um, if it is lost or foreclosed, then there is nothing in the symbolic order in terms of the objet a that can cause desire. So in terms of mourning, a particular object may be lost that in terms of the objet a, that is a relation in the field of the big other. And, and so, but, but the das ding that lies behind it is still, something in the real is still there. And so that gives the opportunity for um, the, the libido or desire, whatever we want to call it, to then transfer over to something else at a later point. But in melancholia, if we understand that as a foreclosure of the, of the real, the thing in the real, then there is nothing left but the ego itself, the imaginary itself. And, and so that's why the, the um, uh, desire and um, disdain is turned upon the ego. And at, at various points, uh, things in the symbolic can, objects in the symbolic can appear and can cause temporary uh, bouts of mania. But, but there is no uh, permanent uh, anchor in the real to create a, um, what Lacan calls a fa fabric in, in Seminar 25, this fabric of the real um, that underlies the vicissitudes of the symbolic and of the objet a. Um, so anyway, that's, that's a lot of complex Lacanian mumbo jumbo, but <laughs> I don't think it's a way, a way of kind of thinking about about these these two uh, phenomena, mourning and melancholia, in relation to psychosis, as, as Mika was was bringing up. Thanks, M Mika. Would you did you have anything you wanted to, to say in response to what Eric's saying? Or, or no, it's it's a differently fascinating way of putting it. But mm -hmm. the one thing that I was thinking is that, well, this might be even a bit banal to say, but this oh sorry foreclosing the real does not it make it go away doesn't it? it it stays but in in an unfamiliar form right but it's in it's incapable of operating in other words hmm. um the 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 presence of das ding um as that that zero level where we have to structure ourselves in relation to desire. We have to maintain a certain distance from it, as Lacan described in Seminar 7, uh, that that's no longer there. And, and so we feel kind of awash in, in, in our imaginary. And, and you know, as Richard is, is talking about in the, in the chat, the object is internalized. How, how is it internalized in the sense that there's nothing in the real to anchor? There's nothing in the real to externalize it. And, and so what, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that the, and, and this is what I think the Lacan's Borromean and not gets at, is that <clears throat> there has to be a relation between the real, the symbolic and the imaginary in terms of how they, they are structured and anchored. And if, you know, we, we talk a lot about in, in, in Lacanian psychoanalysis about the, the failure of the symbolic, right? But what about the failure of the real? And that's kind of what I'm getting at here. We, 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 because I think what we experience today is depression, uh, and this this global phenomenon of depression is not a failure of the symbolic at all. I think it's we live in a world of of full of of symbolic relations, but what's foreclosed is something in the real to that that causes our desire. I will move to, to Chitan and then Evren, unless Mika, you wanted to respond to that? No, thank you. Okay, Chitan, go for it. 
Hi, hi, everyone. Thanks, Kadil, for a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to sort of briefly respond to uh, Eric, actually. Um, I, 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 you know, to think with him, I would, I understand where he's coming from, but I would have a doubt here, uh, sort of a fundamental one, uh, that if we are saying the real is so closed, if we're arguing in that in, in that manner, uh, one is, wouldn't we get into the problem that that without the real, the symbolic and imaginary wouldn't work? So either you become a machine. Real is the, the necessary gap there, if I'm not wrong, isn't it? So uh, the, the the functioning of the closure of real would would mean something totally different from closure of the symbolic in that in, in that sense, and it would have a larger implications upon something about you know uh, being human and so on and so forth. Uh, the second uh, sort of uh, thing that we need, we would need to sort of uh, think about in in, in the structure would be that when we are saying that in psychosis there is a closure of the symbolic this doesn't mean that you cannot use language it, it's not that you know it is a foreclosure of the name of the father in in that sense where as lagan would say unconscious is not working you know it it means something different from simply an inability to use language it actually does mean what eric eric is saying that when name of the father is closed you lose relationship with the thing so that 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 process is already happening in psychosis uh, that, that, that something of the nature of the thing is at stake in psychosis itself. So how would we make those distinctions? Something I, I would it would be interesting to think about. And, you know. Uh, yeah, I, good points. I I I I, I agree, um, and that's why I I made the caveat that I'm I'm just kind of thinking uh, very speculatively, and 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 literally I thought about this a few moments before we. Uh, before we started today, so it's kind of fresh. But and I think uh, Richard uh, is making some excellent points in, in the chat, and and I think in in the very late Lacan, he there is this um, focus upon the um, the real of the body, and something that Richard is is talking about in the chat. Um, you know where. You know, we talk in terms of psychosis. We talk about what is foreclosed and the symbolic returns in the real. Um, perhaps there's a sense in which what is foreclosed in the real returns in the imaginary, in the ego, and so there is this um, struggle uh, within the ego uh, that otherwise would be structured, mediated by the symbolic, and and you know getting some distance from the real but that relation to das ding returns in, in a sense in the in the real of the, e the of the ego the imaginary the, we could call that the, the following zizek the the imaginary real something like that maybe um but again i'm, I'm just kind of spitballing all of this so i, I apologize <laughs> for the confusion <laughs> Uh, in my own thinking, actually, this question of melancholy is something of. Uh, can I sort of speak before we go to Abdul? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, in my own thinking, actually, there is something of of melancholy. It's taken all morning. You know, uh, it's almost like the, that minimum uh, excess that exists. You know, it's, it's the same problem that when you actually have, have to have a relationship with an external object, there is something at stake of identification even when you have to engage with any libidinal energy with, with an external object. In the same manner, there's something like melancholia always at stake in moaning. You know? So moaning itself uh, cannot be uh, completely realized without there being uh, some, um, um, uh, some of its contact with, uh, you know, um, how, do we, how do we think through that contact with melancholia and, 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 what, and what is at stake of ego in, in, in man's relationship with an external object? I think that, that, that's the, uh, the problem that, that, that came to me. And in that problem, this, what interested me and which I would want to ask others, how do they understand it? What is at stake of at this question of ambivalence of emotion, ambivalence of love that he talks about? Is, is the love ambivalent from the start to actually handle the pressure of identification? Is it? Or is it? Does it become ambivalent later to for, for for it to incorporate the ego into its into its uh, mechanisms? Uh, or how do, how do we understand that that something of ambivalence that is required to manage the excess of identification that that is that is required to maintain the ego in that sense? 
and how do we think through that that problem? I, I'm not sure. I have an answer, but something which I think we all can, you know. Sorry, can I about. jump in and you um, just it, yeah. unpack a little bit to something that Jadon has said? Um, I mean, um, isn't it the case that we quite, quite often see people um, sort of um, reproaching their own ego, then their own self is so deplorable and the ego is belittled and so on. And it seems to coincide quite usually with the stance of uh, identifying almost like with a big other of the fatherland of some kind of large state or almost like a becoming an instrument of some kind of uh, hallucinatory uh, big other like, for example, some communist would be completely belittling their own self in the name of the party, but the party would be in connection to the big other of the history and so on. This type of uh, structural model, one would say. Uh, and isn't it the case that they sort of like coincide and there is the lack of any symbolic efficacy, which Freud would see in psychoanalysis and uh, the... Uh, other point I was thinking that when you think that there is uh, some melancholia in on mourning, we have to distinguish mourning and melancholia perhaps a bit sharp, more sharply, I would say, if we are following the way that Freud characterizes them. Um, without going into mourning too much, uh, I would say that the kind of uh, situation where the melancholic doesn't know what he or she has lost in the object um, it has a certain constitutive uh, approach to 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 the relation with other people. It, it, it's as Freud discusses at the end of the paper. It's it's um, either a constitutive state for relations with the world, or it's something that has been uh, has has come about through some traumatic. Uh, uh, situation which requires first the predisposition to be that has just been brought out so sort of like a psychosis outbreak from some real loss but it can also be that the melancholic is just um, facing insults facing slights facing setbacks all the time the characteristics that we usually today uh, identify with depression are there in Freud's characterization of melancholia. I, I'm also thinking of the notion of microaggressions, like facing microaggressions all the time and accumulating some kind of hatred for oneself through this. He, Freud says that it's a battle of ambivalence, that it's, it's a kind of like a struggle that's, that's being brought out to the surface from time and time again in melancholia. It's, it's, it's some kind of a battle, yeah. Just a couple want, of points. I just want to make sure, Evren, we get to get to you. You've had your hand raised for, for a while now. Yes, uh, I would like to uh, make a short contribution uh, regarding the distinction between uh, depression and uh, melancholia. Uh, I would like to refer to Darian Lida as well. So, uh, okay, according to Freud, uh, in melancholia, it's the ego that is dry and empty. Uh, but uh, Darian Lider says that, uh, of course, the people who are depressed are also, they also feel worthless. So the distinction that he makes is uh, uh, the depressed ones who feel worthless are silent. They don't express this. Uh, whereas uh, melancholics openly express uh, their loss, uh, also, Darian Lider uh, refers to uh, regarding mourning uh, symbolic uh, murder. Uh, uh, and he's referring there to Naomi Klein. Uh, but uh, we know that the members of uh, uh, the Ljubljana school, uh, they always end up with uh, vertigo when they talk about uh, melancholia. So they are they, uh, they rather than uh, symbolic, uh, they refer to the real loss there, which is uh, in Hegelian sense, uh, negation of the negation, loss of the loss, where we go to the first place and actually reconsider our attachment that what we think we lost actually 
is not what we think we lost in the first place. Uh, that's what uh, I would like to uh, say. Thanks. Okay. Um, two, two, I think. Um... Richard has been very, very vocal in the in the chat. Richard, would you like would you like to speak as well? Or no? We can we can we can save yeah, he's it. Mute, he's mute. I, I think Richard, I is mute. Mute. Richard, you have to unmute your this damn technology, Richard. Got it. I got it. I got you it. got it. There you go, buddy. OK. Um, OK, so let's hear you. OK, so. Uh, First of all, there's another, you're talking about people that have normal object relations in that time, let's say, where they were human beings, okay? There's another dimension, and that is when people conceive of themselves as being bound to another human being. So Freud says, originally the ego includes everything, later it separates off an external world from itself. Um, and uh, Francis Tustin, who I consider one of the world's greatest psychoanalysts, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, um, she said, the child behaves as if it's fused with the outside world, and outside objects are experienced as prolongation uh, of body sensations. Everything is experienced as me, the not me is quickly made into the me. And that's another way of talking about internalization. And as Brilliant. you know, I wrote a book called Symbiosis and Separation. So when I talk about loss, I'm not talking about mourning. I'm talking about a part of the self that becomes split off from the self when it's experienced as a part of the self. And that, and that happens in symbiosis. And then there's a split from the object that's a part of the self. The other aspect uh, of what you're discussing and, and, uh, is the difference between mourning and simple separation, where the object is just, in Zen, the idea is not to mourn the object, but to let it go. So one of the basic principles of Zen is when an idea comes into your mind, you say, not that, not that, not that, that's not me. So a lot of what I experience is not mourning. Mourning is a relatively healthy process when you really have love and object relations. But a lot of what occurs is people just let go of things. They, they just drift away from the self, and that's not mourning. Letting go is different than mourning. That would be the second point I would make, that, that, it's a, that, that, that mourning is a relatively healthy and sophisticated process. Now, as far as melon, and it's all, all of this is in Freud's papers, the, the, the foundation. That's why I like what you do here, because you're starting with a foundation. Well, that's how I see Freud as the foundation. And I think that maybe some of your frustration is that there, there are a lot of people here who have dived a lot into the, the technical literature that has been developed since Freud, um, which can become very jargon heavy and can become very um, perhaps abstracted away from- Abstracted. Away from, from, from some of the, the, the very simple processes which Freud is describing with clear language. Um, and that, and that's why I, that's why I'm focusing on Freud's papers personally, because I, I feel as though um, what he describes is something very simple and something that can be described to the common person very easily. I would call it foundational. I'd say foundational. Simple. Yeah. I would in say other simple. words, you can't study uh, nuclear uh, physics until you know what an atom is. And, and well, what, I think there are some electronic. people here. I think there are some people here who are the equivalent of nuclear physicists okay or or okay so but, but the, like and and i can under i can understand why there's a, a gap but and, and and some frustration because if if you don't understand the, specifically the lacanian jargon then it, it can be very maddening even you know like that 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 uh it's it's difficult to follow let's say the other point about melancholia 
is, and this relates to Melanie Klein, if you want to go beyond Freud, and that is the psychosomatic experience of the internal object. Once the object is experienced, it is internalized into the self. And there's nothing complicated or unreal about this. We all have psychosomatic symptoms, correct? And we all experience objects as a part of ourselves. And these inflict pain upon us, uh, uh, which we sometimes cannot control. They're a part of us, but they're also ego alien. So, you know, my wife gets pains in her stomach all the time, or, or she, has, she starts hitting her leg out of the clear blue sky, usually when I approach her. Uh, and I say, well, that's a psychosomatic symptom. So psychosomatic symptoms are at the foundation of this process of what you've called melancholia, when the object becomes part of the self. This is why this, the superego attacks itself. Again, this may seem old fashioned because people have spent the last 30 years trying to get rid of their superego. Uh, this is a whole nother story. We used to have this strong sense of morality now we just say, fuck it, let's do what we want. And I can observe that. Um, no, no, I've, I've, I've experienced that. I tried, to, I tried to relate that in the presentation very personally. I've, I've experienced this feeling of melancholia where I felt I was being constantly attacked by my superego to the point where I would overcome all of my eating drives and my basic sexual drives, where I basically dead, I deaded, I, I killed myself. So that is the superego. That's yeah, the I know. Analysis. <laughs> it's when you punish yourself in yeah. various ways yeah. by depriving yourself. And sometimes it can go too far. It, it's a, it could also be a so, way. But, so that's, so that's, the, that's the point that I would like to talk. Actually, that's what interested me the most about the papers. What I wanted to talk about is that Freud's pointing towards the mystery of melancholia as something which potentially leads to suicide. And he's, he's astonished that there are processes, psychological processes, which could lead to the, the, to the destruction of, of the libido itself. And, 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 and I think that that, I think a lot of what processes are describing there are processes which he's describing in a clinical dimension, but which have a lot of overlap with processes which are often described in a spiritual way, like to try to get no self and to rid the, and to rid the you know, to, to, to rid the self of, of, of its own conception of itself. Well, that, this is the Buddhist conception yeah. is in a sense a defense against too much aspiration and too much. This lady we could talk about that jumped out the window the other day. I'm sure most people must have read about that. It's rare that the news uh, tells a story which is so relevant to psychoanalysis. Are you aware of that, Cadell, this beautiful lady that was a star on TV? She was doing so many wonderful things. She was Miss Wichita, and then she got on TV, and she had all these jobs, and she jumped out a window and killed herself. Is that anybody else aware of that? I haven't heard about that, no. But I mean, that happens, yeah. Yeah, well, this was, it's a big story. I mean, I do look at the news sometimes. Um, and, and the way I understood it was that she just had too much. It was too overwhelming for her, all this success. People want to know, was she depressed? Actually, in some way, it was just the opposite. She just, it's the same way like with Michael Jackson, right? Certain people put too much on them. He was, you know, he's a 50, he's a young, he was a thin guy, he's a fragile person, and he's supposed to do all these fucking concerts one after the other, and nobody counseled him, hey, cool it, man, you know? So, yeah, I think, I think the same happens to a lot of mega, mega pop stars. Um, let, let's let's just let's just first get to get to let's keep keep let's keep you in the conversation, Richard. But let's get to Mika and then Eric, and then if you have another question, we'll we'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, yeah. I like. To thank you for your views here, first of all. But um, and I would also I would like to comment that maybe it would be preferable if somebody else who hasn't already spoken would speak. But then again, I I. I want to make the remark that um, 
maybe it would be beneficial to think of uh, the type of conversion hysteria, uh, which uh, is manifested by ideas of the body, of punishing the body or, or so on, uh, from melancholia proper, from melan the work of melancholia, it's a different kind of a process. I would say that the uh, predisposition for hysteria is in the capacity for conversion, for uh, displacing energy from psychical sphere to bodily action and so on. Conversion and we all, hysteria yeah. would definitely be part of what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point to make it, but I, I, I would like to be able to somehow distinguish the process of uh, melancholia from, from, from this uh, phenomenon. Hmm. Yeah, we'll go Eric, then Chita, and then Jayati. I just want, wanted to, on, on uh, Richard's behest, um, and, and thank you so much for your comments and your, your experience that you bring uh, to the conversation. I wanted to put my comments into more orthodox Freudian terms. Um, Freud uh, does speak in this paper, um, and I think there's a foot, maybe a footnote in relation into uh, or about the um, his, his his essay on uh, group psychology, where there is this this notion of the introjection of the object into the ego, and that's I think the the foundational concept that he identifies both here in, in regard to um, uh, melancholia as well as uh, group formation, you know that sort of thing. And, and I think that that's what I was trying to get out at with, with this notion of um, um, foreclosure of the real. So the, the object is no longer in the real, but it's interjected into the ego. Um, and then, then there is this strong presence of the superego within melancholia. And, and, and that's why in, in, in regard to what Mika was saying or, uh, at the beginning in regard to psychosis, um, in, in contrast to psychosis where the symbolic is foreclosed, there is still in melancholia this, the normal functioning, if not even a greater functioning of this super egoic um, presence. Um, and, and so it is this combination of uh, the the interjection of the object into the into the ego, i.e. the imaginary, um, and the uh, still functioning symbolic or super ego, that is the uh, primary feature I think that we see in in uh, melancholia. So I hope that clears things up. Interjection is a classic psychoanalytic term. It, it, you know, internalization is a less strong term as interjection because that implies very deep within the self but i don't see where interjection is related to psychosis or the unreal because the internalized objects are very strong within the self and sometimes they provide stability when you have an internalized object one of the problems oh, no, i i, I did I didn't want to relate it to psychosis. I wanted to contrast it with psychosis. Okay. Yeah. All right, Chit Chitan. I think let's go to Jyoti and Sahil first. Uh, I'll sort of I take change the topic. So. Okay, yeah. we'll go Jyoti, Jyoti and then Sahil. It's okay. The gang is great. So Chitan, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, I keep on talking. Please go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm going. We'll get to Chitan. We'll get to Chitan. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there are three things. So um, first of all, there is there are a lot of interesting insights about love which are happening uh, when we look at love and the tragedy which is always there with love. One can then see from where is the tragedy coming. Uh, when we forget the contradiction and the balance that needs to be maintained between loving and not loving, which Richard, uh, I would use Richard's 
phase of letting go, which was also important. What we can see here is a collapse that is happening, uh, which can which can have a narcissistic ten tendencies, and then there can be a certain kind of tragedy. Uh, it's interesting, like um, in my own uh, episodes of melancholia, I could like relate when um, you have this uh, in this entire self abnegation, you are actually hating the one. Whom you, whom you love and how all of it gets projected also. So that was very interesting. Um, I, I, I just wanted to hear from other people, how do they look at this love thing? Second thing, uh, there is something about time uh, happening. There is a something, there's something about future happening, which is coming in the transient article also, but I felt that he left it because when he's talking of melancholia, he's also talking that how uh, there is this incapacity to see future. There is a certain kind of lack of imagination also, where one can't see the future, which one can also see again in another contradiction of, you know, how is it that the ego self-love uh, is also changes into ego self-destruction also. Uh, like uh, in my own experience, I have I have felt that one, you want something so badly that when the, the impossibility of attaining it comes to you, you land up hating that thing, hating yourself also for the sheer impossibility of getting it. So is it to do uh, with the, uh, is it to do with uh, our inability to handle the transitory nature and the fact that we are constantly seeking certain kind of immortality or permanence around it. Uh, somewhere I felt that in the melancholy article, he left that inside. He talked about it, but or, or maybe not, I could. It's not brought out enough. It's unfortunately not brought out enough. He, he mentions it at the beginning that the unconscious yeah. almost has this wish for immortality or the unconscious has this wish for permanence and, and struggles enormously with, 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 with transience and impermanence, but it, it's, you're right, it's not further explicated, which I think it's, it's a feature of him sort of dipping his toes in the waters of philosophy, but. Yeah, I, I yeah. Well, the, the fantasy of immortality of course, is in many ways in contradiction to the idea of transience. He just mentions immortality once, but my work revolves around the fantasy of immortality and how it contradicts the wish for like normality or love. I mean, you know, when Hitler got married, just before he committed suicide. So once <laughs> he, he, he got married one day of happiness and he, that was because the immortal object, Germany was finally dying and he could let it go. He, he could, Hitler could not, Hitler is Germany, just as Germany is Hitler. It's a perfect example of this massive identification with the immortal object. And then he finally, uh, you know, got married and then he committed suicide. But he said he couldn't get married because his real love out there was Germany. And this is something we haven't discussed. You touched upon how we fall in love with abstractions and become at one with them through identification and how we can have a traumatic separation from an abstract object, which is happening in the United States right now. It's like, you know, America used to be a beloved object and now there's a fragmentation. The same process that happens in an individual can happen in an entire culture and you feel it falling apart. Um, and, and why that's happening? Did we want it to happen that way? Is it gonna do us good? Or is it simply, there's just too much out there. You mentioned so many things, uh, Cadell, that you can do and see now. There's no longer the scarcity of information. Yeah, not the scarcity anymore as it was in, in Freud's time. But I wanna make sure back to Jayadi, uh, that you, did you finish expressing yourself? Cause I think what you're bringing no, up- I have last, uh, yeah, last well, question, well, which was to you, uh, Kedal. In your presentation, you were talking about the shadow of nature and the shadow of love object, which falls on ego. And then you were also talking how this loss of ego, it has a spiritual dimension to it. Um, uh, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, capture the spiritual uh, dimension when we are looking at this collapse that is happening. So I can understand loss of ego and the spirituality, but when we are having the collapse in melancholy of love object with the ego, uh, I, I'm missing the connection here. So I was well, I looking can, for I, I, I can offer you a story, which I actually frequently yeah. tell. 
uh, as it relates. And and here my thinking, I'm, I'm trying to think this. I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, in a wondering about this. So, so the way I, I wondered, about, wondered about it was uh, I went to a Buddhist temple a few years ago and all the while they were emphasizing, of course, impermanence. They were emphasizing impermanence of all things, transience of all things, um, and, 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 and so, and so forth. And, and also, uh, obviously in the practice of meditation, a lot of it is about, um, letting go of your ego attachments, letting go of your self notion and, and that the, the self is empty and so forth. And then I was asking some of the, the Buddhist monks why they had become monks. And almost invariably they described to me a tragedy with love. <laughs> So they described to me uh, that they had a relationship, a marriage, which didn't work. They described to me sort of being frustrated with their sexuality and not knowing what to do with it. There was one monk because we were there at a time when there was a bunch of young people there and there was a monk, we had become friendly with each other. And he leaned over to me and he was like, there's so many beautiful women here. And he was like, freaked out about it, but it was like cute. Right. But like the whole point is like that there's this, I, I wonder the, I wonder how many people are trying to develop a spiritual life because of melancholia. Well, you're saying that, uh, that there's yeah. also a defensive aspect to Buddhism. In other words, Buddha became a Buddha when he realized that people died. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in some way, he's a big baby. He couldn't take reality. So there's also a very strong defensive element, as you point out, uh, a reaction to the loss of love or the inability to love, and it becomes defensive. So there has to be a balance between using it to separate and to balance yourself, but also using it to not care, to, you know, I want nothing. Speaking of ideology here, uh, I mean, there is also a good point to be made about the uh, difference between norms and how to use norms. So basic point would be that in ideologies, we always have to have rules, but also the way that we relate to rules. So this guy whispering at your ear, sort of like uh, obscene uh, fraternity within the system is essential for any system. Uh, and speaking of abstractions, I think that maybe Hegel would be good point to bring here, since Hegel thinks that uh, the nothingness that Buddhists speak about is uh, their, their principle of everything, the ultimate goal. The, Hegel says that this is really a kind of a love of abstraction mm -hmm. in, in, effect, in, in, in effect. So the uh, yeah. Buddhist idea of God as nothingness with, has this implication that a human being as this uh, limited transit ego and so on, ego is deplored as blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, but it becomes God through annihil annihilating itself. That, that's the point that Hegel makes about Buddhism. I love that. To mind. But, but yeah, maybe something else. Um, well, just want to make, just want to make sure Jayati, you've said everything you wanted to say. Yep. Okay. I think the important point, I really like that you emphasize this, this dimension of transience and the psyche. And I think that it's underestimated, especially as it relates to um, our spontaneous tendency to think in terms of space. And, and actually when you start to think about time, there's, a, there's an emotional dimension to that, which, is, which I think Freud is starting to, to, to point out. And, and yeah, and that has a huge relevance to contemporary psychology because, you know, again, we're throwing throwing pills at people not knowing how to deal with all of their affective disorders um and and not really sort of thinking about sort of this this the the deeper spiritual questions about transience which i think um that's that's sort of where my mind uh, uh why it points in that, that direction but uh sahil can i just, can I just quickly say, yeah. say one thing uh, yes, uh yes. just to add to this discussion uh you know we know that unconscious actually has this timelessness attached to it Unconscious, yes. if, you, if you remember, you know, it is timeless. It, it, it is it, it is free from mutual contradictions and so on and so forth. Unconscious yes, yes. mental processes are, you know, the, like Freud writes about it. In the, so there is always this desire and ego to find that that immortality, that unconscious uh, freeness back in, the, in in some senses, and which, yes. which, we, which we need to think about. I'm not going to go further into it, 
but there is something about it which we can explore further. This question of immortality that attaches to ego well, is would, something would, linked to that that thing in in the unconscious itself. So, I, I would be inter- I would be interested in you further going into it uh, later in the in the in the talk if you're open to going into it. Yeah, yeah like we can, to, can do that. We can do that. Hear Definitely. your views on it. Definitely. Um, but I want to make sure, and I want to make before we get to Sahil, uh, I want to make everyone uh, aware that. We heard it here first that Buddha is a big baby by Richard. I think I like that quote. That's uh, that's nice. And Sahil, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks a lot, Kadel, for your presentation, for doing this. I really appreciate the opportunity. This is my second workshop. I was there for instincts and vicissitudes last time. And I really appreciated hearing all of you on that. Um, I'm a PhD student at University of Wisconsin-Madison in geography. And I'm interested in questions of power, desire, and futurity. And uh, I'm going to talk more because I have a newfound interest in psychoanalytically informed philosophy. I'm going to uh, talk more from my experience. I think the readings selected for today were very, very much resonant in my own life experience. I am dealing at a personal level with someone who is deeply inflicted with melancholia. And I think a lot of this will help me restructure my relationship in that uh, in that particular episode. Uh, I am also uh, someone who has uh, personally gone through mourning uh, regarding permanence. And I think Jyoti's question on transience and thinking about questions of immortality here are very relevant, especially when, uh, when you lose something in permanence and you're not able to find a way to uh, to to accept that and then eventually over time lapse of time allows you to to kind of digest and move forward and lastly I think one more thing I think very important which I found for myself is uh, this question of uh, thinking about how uh, experiences in life um, change over time because during my entire childhood and this is something which was so strong in what I would call my life force uh, was the fact that I could never imagine death. Uh, the very thought of there being a cutoff point to myself was a moment of complete and absolute explosion of myself. I could not. So during my entire childhood, it was a forbidden thought to ever think about the fact that I am not permanent, that I am impermanent. Sorry, I'm not impermanent, that I am going to at some point stop existing and it was it was a forbidden no go zone because whatever i might be doing i couldn't even imagine uh, that thought and over time i think what richard mentioned as uh, the sh- the split in the self away from the ego becoming sorry the ego uh, internalizing everything to uh, a shift away really helps me think through because i am comfortable with that thought for a a long time now and I don't understand how or why but I think this really helps me so thanks for that Richard I think the discussions here are extremely interesting I'd like to, us to think one point about schizophrenia because I the way I read the end of the morning and melancholia article was that uh, at some level uh, the schizophrenia can be seen as a culmination of mania and uh, melancholia operating within the same individual and then I wonder I mean that's how I understood it it might not be the case but I'm just wondering then how one thinks about this question of uh, a drive to suicide and to basically how does mania trans transcend back into melancholy of that force that you can see a stop to you can put a stop to life itself you know like how does that shift this kind of extreme opposition coexist and transcend in human beings. So I don't know if that helps, but thank you for the opportunity. I, I like your thought about the inability to think about death. I mean, as you know, Ernest Becker, who won a Pulitzer Prize, wrote a book called Denial, Denial of Death and an even greater book called Escape from Evil. And, and I think that is at the deepest level at the human psyche, uh, the inability to contemplate one's own death. And if there is anything that is repressed or denied, it's the reality 
uh, of our eventual non-existence. And the other side of the coin, I made a joke with Cadeau uh, a, a, a while back where we were talking about evolution and apes and I mentioned the pyramid and he had a, a nice reaction to it. Um, the pyramid was when human beings escaped from their uh, status as animals. This fraud of evolutionary psychology uh, explains nothing about the history of the human race because almost all the great things the human beings have done have been an escape from our animal nature. Tell me how pyramids help us to survive and pass our genes along. So the quest for immortality, and this is part of all of us and why everybody writes books. Almost everybody that writes a book nowadays thinks they're gonna be Shakespeare or Aristotle, uh, including Cadell. Or, uh, or, or, a, or a Richard Konensberg. Well, I'm not there yet. I think I could put you know, Aristotle. Think, but you, 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 even, you, have the, you have one of the strongest minds I have ever come in contact with. That's why I'm here. I, I, I just delete. Wait, the, just wait. Just wait till you understand the nuclear physicists we got here with Mika and 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 Eric and and Chitan. This they. No, I'm just trying to figure out Aristotle. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean seriously. Well, Aristotle. There's a passage in Aristotle's book, The Politics, and this is where my career began. I was in a class with Norman O. Brown, one of the great thinkers of the 20th century. Definitely. And, and, and there was a, the first line in Aristotle, I was in Wesleyan University in a special advanced class, because all of them had higher IQs than me. Um, and he said, he read the passage from Aristotle, everywhere man joins the polis to lead the good life. And I raised my hand and said, Professor Brown, Professor Brown, what about masochism? And he ran to the board and he wrote masochism and all the, the Christian students with 180 IQ congratulated me on the way out. And you know what I did? I went to the bookstore and bought the Primer of Freudian Psychology. And as August Kubitschek said to Hitler, that or Hitler said to August, that is where it began. So my career in studying psychoanalysis came from that one passage, and then I had to figure out what masochism was. And as it turns out, it's at the core of human existence. And Freud called it the death instinct. I still call it the death instinct and not the death drive, because the death instinct implies, and it's related to death, that we're breaking down uh, continually. I mean, I'm old now. As Aunt Blobby used to say, you know, on Johnny Carson, I'm old, I'm old. So as you grow older, the disintegration is experienced psychosomatically. And that's different than the experience of knowing you're going to die. I used to run, you know, I was a champion in long distance running. I had a full athletic scholarship. And there's a linear curve which you are not there yet, Cadell. I think you're 36, right? And you're a bodybuilder. So you can- chart. I don't think I'm quite a bodybuilder, but- <laughs> All right, well, chart, do, do some scientific research. Do a chart and chart your best squat year by year by year. So if you're 36 now, oh uh, you can predict, there's already research on this. By 60, your squat weight will go from 200 pounds to 100 pounds. And that is what Freud meant by the death instinct, in my humble opinion, the gradual breakdown of your organic structure, which has nothing to do with anything except biology. Okay. Thanks for your, thanks for your thoughts there, Richard. I just want to make sure we get to Linus. Are you there? Yes. Um... Welcome. The name is Enos, but yes, sorry. it's fine. Yeah, that's a common mistake that people make, but it's it's a Finnish name. So um Enos. Yeah. Um there's there's first of all, thanks for letting me in on this um very like fascinating uh conversation with many facets. Um it seems like this paper is something that 
pretty much like a, a whole week full of conversations could could dwell on because it's so dense and there's also so much um, so much resonance probably with all all the um, people here and and many others but um a couple of points that came to my mind um, have to do with what uh, what Mika said uh, with regards to Darian Leader's uh, interpretation of the text and um, his kind of um, um, understanding of mourning and melancholy and depression being very strongly linked together. And also in connection to this, uh, I was thinking about Evren's point, which he brought out very it was a small point, but it seems like a, an important one to think about. That is, um, what exactly is the difference between depression and melancholia? Because it seems like melancholia, uh, particularly for Freud in this paper, seems to be something very limited, like a very, actually quite like special thing. At least he doesn't make a very big like, um, generalizations of it to other other similar types of or depression like states and everyone said something about the uh, melancholic state being uh, characterized by this this desire to talk about one's uh, one's uh, lacks one's uh, uh, like to basically talk about or, or to bring forth one's self-reproaches, whereas in depression, these are, are hidden. And I was wondering if this uh, holds, if this like position holds something, something deeper within itself. So does the melancholic have, or is the melancholic sort of um, internalized, um, in, internalized or the fact that the melancholy melancholic has internalized the object uh, to which he or she feels both love and hate is is this a reason for the fact that for the melancholic it is it is particularly uh, 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 it, it it only applies to the melancholic that that he or she wants to make it known that 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 she despises herself and um it seems that the melancholics uh relationship to themselves and and to their lack is is pretty particular and maybe should be distinguished from from depression in a in a more like uh clear way yeah i was i was um yeah maybe Maybe I will just leave this question out for people to maybe anyone, answer. If I can brief off this uh, leader, yeah, go, leader, go leader's it. account and, and if we stay with the idea of depression, I'm, uh, I am really tempted to ma make a statement that's um, encountering Darren Leader's uh, view of depression and melancholia and mourning was kind of a shocker to me since I had always thought of myself as someone who has depressions or goes through depressions and um, really questioning this kind of identification almost with some kind of answer was a bit of a, like a shocker and it, it really uh, pushed my thoughts forward in, in certain directions and I'm more and more falling uh, to, to uh, going towards Freud's original views and what Freud says and how it clarifies our uh, structures more clearly. But the point about depression um, that really struck, shook me was that depression really is as a, if we treat it as a term for research into psychology and psychiatry and so on, it's really a term that uh, is basically something like maybe 40 years old as a popular term. And it was invented as much at, or created as much as it was discovered back then. 
I mean, it, 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 it's not a natural phenomenon. It's not some kind of um, biomedical problem, although we like to think some, for some odd reason as a society that depression can be treated almost like a bacterial infection. Just take the raw, right drug and or avoid the wrong drugs. <laughs> this kind of not, like obsessional neurotic like taxation of the wrong drugs and the benefit of the good drug that comes from the company who did the research on. I mean, it's completely uh, clear that most of the research for depression comes from the industry for the very drug that's the uh, <laughs> how conveniently the the research then finds out how the drug works so well on the, on the depressive and so on. But I wouldn't dwell on this point too much. But maybe it would be good to know that depression is, a, as it is used overall, very vague, as Larry Alida says. But what is happening in 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 depression when we think about it is it's some kind of uh, uh, to use Lacanian terms, which go to Freud, an ideal image of ourselves becomes punctured. We, we, we are no longer lovable as, as the way that we were. Something's happened and then the self becomes a deplorable entity and this type of uh, development of the ego that then, then keeps on with the all the slides, all the setbacks, everything that's accompanied by depression, usually the type of uh, not being able to overcome the, the, the obstacles or the setbacks that one faces in one's reality. They can be, when we apply the psychoanalytic method, Freud's wager basically is that it can be treated. It's not some kind of mysterious black box that you cannot get out of. It's the work of mourning, he says, the work of melancholia, he says, it's a, you have to retrieve the images that are associated with the thing and you have to start repeating the, that's basically what Freud also says, that you have to start repeating the, 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 the self-punishment and see how every time there's a, like a piecemeal process where you, where something gets taken away from the, from the symptomatic, uh, self-reproach and so on. It's, it's a process where uh, each repetition is, is always a repetition and a plus a something that's always a bit in an addition to it. So what I would like to say that it's, it's not a dead end as the depressive state would say. And, and really going to Freud's terms would bring as much clarity to, to difficult issues with depression, I would say, as I have I've seen, yeah. Sorry, can I yeah, go uh, for it. interject just and feel free just to, to continue? Yeah. yeah, just to continue at this point, because uh, about this idea that um, melancholia could be sort of overcome with a kind of mourning, so that the cure for melancholia would be to go over the, the representations of the object as in mourning. Um, you know, like this to me seems like a very intuitive point, but at the same time, uh, in the, the book by Darian Leader, The New Black, he makes a point that um, this can actually be very dangerous uh, for the melancholic in particular, because whereas um, mourning uh, consists in, in a process of so-called reconstituting the, the object or uh, sort of reconstituting the, the object that um, uh, holds the place of black in, in the person's life. So in mourning, this place of black is sort of uh, gone over and all the people and all the Im images that have um, occupied it are sort of gone over like little by little. And then eventually the uh, cathexis uh, the libidinal, libidinal investments might uh, or will like slowly start to uh, lose their grip. But according to Leder, this like going through this process for the melancholic particularly could be dangerous because um, 
the whole dimension of lack is occupied by the last the last object for the melancholic. Freud so, says it could lead to suicide. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So it seems like it's, and this idea kind of, for me at least, makes melancholia seem very, like uh, something that seems quite, quite, quite different from, from depression and maybe something that should be treated like, or that should be kept separate maybe. Um, it seems quite mysterious in a way, like it's it's kind of hard to understand this kind of depth of investment in one object. Why can letting go of the object lead to suicide? You would think that being able to let go of the melancholic object would gradually diminish the depression uh, not lead to suicide. The suicide would be when that object is so deeply internalized that you can't escape it. Now, I'm not saying it's an easy process to let go of whatever that object is, but I, I don't think letting go of it, letting go of it might make you feel bad, empty, but, but I don't see where that would, the suicide comes from the self-punishment from the object. Isn't there a clear uh, way that Freud gives to certain, um, well, he thinks that the kind of uh, original reproach or trying to punish the object sort of gets displaced to the ego in melancholia. So it's a no brainer to say that the suicide would be an attempt then to punish others. I mean, I know people for, for, for my own close visitude who have threatened with suicide to try and manipulate basically people with suicide even. Well, punish- And, and they are depressed. They, they, they can be depressed. Why, yeah. why not? I think it's very common in, in failed love to threaten with suicide. I, I, on a very personal level, I remember as a child, um, my dad did that to my mom. I mean, it, I think it's very common. I think it's very common. It's 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 absurdly common, and especially if you. I remember when I was a teenager listening to emo music. I mean, almost all of emo music is constituted by these ridiculous games of threatening suicide. <laughs> like, maybe if I kill myself, you'll finally notice me. Guitar riff. <laughs> it's so absurd. <laughs> Richard, did you want to uh, say anything? But otherwise, I'll get to Sahil and then Chitin. Go ahead. Okay, Sahil first and then Chitin. Yeah, I just I just wanted to point us back to uh, one thing that uh, Freud mentions about melancholia that uh, there is a it is also a set of complaints that come out in relation to uh, uh, the you know a complaint against the loved one in that sense. And I'm just wondering where that comes about in the dealing with melancholia, because at least personally, for me, depression uh, is more connected to what um, uh, Cadell, you were mentioning in relation to uh, the modern condition and abundance. And the very fact that there is a relationship of scarcity and enjoyment, which we lack today. And that could be a could be one of the ways modern uh, notions of depression have emerged you know an inability to enjoy and thus deal with uh, depression as a condition rather melancholia here uh, seems to be more something that has to run its course uh, either through that fury that that complaint in relation to the the the, the lost loved object or loved one and otherwise uh, it seems to be something that uh, needs to be dealt with uh, in a very different way. So I, definitely there is, uh, at least for me, there is a clear divide between melancholia and depression in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not an, I'm not an expert on it. And I actually, I haven't thought extremely deeply about depression. I'd be, I, but I was interested in, in your reflection on depression coming up as, you know, uh, this social phenomenon um, that you, I mean, it's, it's in the common language now everywhere. And 
And, and is it something I'd be interested whether Miko or Ennis have a reflections on that of, 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 from their readings of Darien Leader? Um, is it connected to living in a society of abundance where now we, we don't have as much uh, contact with scarcity and struggle, but we are um, in an overabundance of pleasure, which is leading people into um, an inability to enjoy, maybe? I don't know. But well, why not? There, there always are society factors involved in them. What, what do you think of this idea, Mika? But maybe the focus would be on what takes place in these, what Freud calls the battles of ambivalence. Are they then that uh, relevant for analysis of depression or not? Maybe that's the question. So uh, the kind of a uh, battle for ambivalent or uh, ambivalent battle, which takes place between or within the ego, within the part that has split off the critical agency that's constantly like uh, Freud links it to the obsessional side of, of neurosis. And uh, isn't it the case that depression is depression because the person or the person's ego is sort of like split between the tyrannical superego that's constantly uh, sort of gives like a bad re bad uh, comments, bad, bad, like, uh, I'm forgetting a wo good word that can, but just the kind of like criti constant criticizing of oneself, the battle of ambivalence of having the one part of oneself that's undergoing a position of uh, having been being beaten, having been, and it might be that the depressed person might identify some person as the one who is oppressing oneself, but ultimately for Freud is the split within the ego. I mean, nobody can take the place of a critical agent in our, in our like living world, unless we, already want well, then, then to get wait to for them to start criticizing then us. you get into yeah. paranoia what you're saying when the object is externalized you're right it's then usually the internalized object that is punishing you but what is so common and particularly in politics is that object is externalized and becomes the other and then the notion is that that sense of oppression was coming from the outside world and in some way, there's a game because you can fight that object. You, it's very difficult to fight your own superego, the critical judgment within. When I was in analysis many years ago, there was a phase I went through where I had the sense of self-punishment. And I went around for about three months saying, kill others, not self. Kill others, not self. So that's the externalization of the death instinct. Yeah, there is a paranoid aspect of, about knowing who is the cause. Know it's all right. Knowing that somebody else is the cause and not mm -hmm. taking taking responsibility. What do they call it? There's a word the young people use uh, for taking it responsibility for yourself yeah. as opposed to blaming somebody else oh let's let's only. remember that it, that it's a different issue than paranoia proper well freud says the paranoia is the externalization of the superego so that you think it's coming from outside rather than inside and that's where war begins externalization of the superego the Jew was inside Hitler. <laughs> Chitin, uh, uh, Sahil, unless, unless are, are, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Otherwise, I'm going to go to Chitin. I just wanted to add that uh, we also have to think about capitalism and its nature of manipulating scarcity at the same time, in the sense that we live in a world of modern abundance, but at the same time, the economics of it works on a economics of scarcity. Yeah. And even, even indigenous or black feminist authors are moving towards reclaiming the term abundance in a way where we don't think about scarcity. So I think that complicates this question further in today's time. Okay. Thank you, Sahil.
Uh, Chitan, would you like to jump in? Uh, I'll just quickly sort of point to this problem of melancholy and depression. Uh, if you look at, say, today's work in, in neuroscience, uh, there are very interesting lectures by Robert Spolsky of Stanford on um, YouTube, if you, you know. And they still refer to this paper of melancholy and mourning to actually explain depression. It's extremely <laughs> interesting. You know, <laughs> they might be <laughs> saying, no, no, it's not. And there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a good reason for that. Because uh, in this paper, actually, Freud was able to bring out some very, very important insight for larger uh, uh, neuroscience structure, which is that... Uh, there's a point at which in, in melancholy you can slip into from which you cannot automatically come back. You know, that is what actually dem demand an explanation in neuroscience and depression and this question of hormones and biology that they are discussing in that they need to distinguish at one point you moan and you come back to your state. In melancholia that is not happening. Something breaks over there and they of course have biological explanations for it. There's a different story. But um, this, 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 this gap between mourning and melancholy actually is important for uh, understanding all kinds of depressions in uh, psychiatric models today and so on and so forth. And I think the reason for that is that there is something of a nature of a problem of identification, this question of internalized object at stake in all depression. Mm. You know, there is, uh, there is, um, and I'm not saying all depression is melancholy. Yeah, that I think that 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 would be uh, silly and stuff. All I'm pointing out is that this question of this this loss of internalized object that that is that comes to the center in melancholia yeah, actually is at stake in almost in anybody who undergoes depression. When you normally use that word, what you actually mean is that they are struggling with a loss that they can't explain in substances. And that that homologous nature with depression always uh, sort of will bring this paper of melancholia will in, in the center to understand this. Um, you know, this question in that sense. I do think, I do think that the, I'd be, I'd be interested to know if there's, there's broad agreement on this, but I do think this struggle with loss and specifically the struggle with loss that you can't control is at the center of all these, all these issues. And, and that like the, you know, the, and of course the biggest, and this is pointing back towards, I think some of the things Jayati was saying, but of course the biggest loss that, that and and back to the beginning of the first Freud paper, the biggest loss is is death, you know, and confronting death and and recognizing that we we are, we are we are mortal beings and and that this does have a real uh, effective dimension on our ability to enjoy and our our ability to develop self knowledge, and, and and I think broadly speaking, we don't live in a society that cultivates this specific form of self knowledge. We, we don't we don't have an educate we don't have an education that incorporates this form of self knowing so 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 I almost feel like because we don't have this built into the very nature of our of our of our education we start to medicate ourselves we don't understand ourselves we we anyway yeah 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 exactly and, and uh, when we are here at the uh, domain of ideology uh, I would like to also read a brief uh, quote from leader's book. Uh, in, in when he describes our current uh, self-image, I mean, depression is uh, something that I think relies on certain conception of the self that's uh, particular for our age, in a way. Uh, we are taught to see nearly every aspect of the human condition as in some sense subject to our conscious choice and potential control. And so when drug companies make uh, drug companies market their products, they play on these modern ingredients of our self-image. Um, and when we are thinking of a depression as some kind of a biological disease, which has somehow managed to reple re re uh, replace the older conceptions of melancholia and mourning, uh, I think that what is incorporated within it is just this uh, ingredient of the what Lacan calls the big other of the social shared space uh, of the symbolic, which is radically uh, decentered way of approaching the problem. I would say, I mean, we identify quite directly with the view of the, ourselves as this self manager and having or not being able to face the stress of the society, the demands of the society, then falling 
into depression as a sort of like a rejection of this whole view of the world or the way of the world this 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 constant uh production of self and so on but it i think it's very curious how the drugs themselves sort of produce the disease i mean the drugs were created alongside with the label depression itself uh, and it is claimed that with the drugs, we can then somehow restore our former view of ourselves, come back to normality and so on. But there are plenty of studies that show that these antidepressant drugs, in fact, they do not do what they are supposed to do. But our society just has an ear for uh, only the positive public relation PR. And we know that the, most of the research is just industry funded. And the drugs themselves, they are not as specific as they are claimed to be. They have serious side effects. And the whole view of the psychiatric system, or, well, not to go too for Goldian here, but it's a kind of a, like a pyramid which, where the top claims that there is no splitting going on, but every step of the pyramid towards the bottom, there is all, always this uh, splitting of antagonisms, of combats, and it's a, sort of like promise to us what we do not even want, this picture of ourselves uh, somehow being able to manage ourselves back to normality or something. I don't know. This is an ideological rambling, but... Yeah. About drugs, I, you know, I'm old. Um, and when I was in analysis many years ago, my analyst was an MD psychiatrist and also a biochemist. Uh, and chairman of the part, uh, psychiatry department at Harvard, by the way, or I wouldn't be talking to you. And one of the first things he said, and this has showed the generational difference, he wanted to make sure I wasn't taking any drugs <laughs> because he felt that if I was taking drugs, that would make it easier for me to avoid confronting my problems. So yeah, he, yeah. he actually would, you know, he actually interviewed me for two days and he wanted and to make sure I wasn't using drugs. And then yeah, I know like, this is really common in, in today's uh, therapy as a, and a psychiatry and so on. And then I, I have noticed a curious phenomenon where people who go to seek a therapist, they, I mean, cannabis is basically the only drug that they can reliably find. So they start avoiding the mo most <laughs> mildest drug, cannabis, and they start to doing uh, amphetamines and even opium and so on because they cannot be detected as easily. And, and, and drugs can themselves become a sort of a uh, way of uh, separating oneself from the system. They can take this place of uh, trying to find some kind of uh, freedom and separation. And it can, it can show as a depression even then. Of course, marijuana is good for encouraging free association. <laughs> Tell me about it. I, I have no 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 negative side effects. Um, so you know, <laughs> yeah, did you? Yeah, want I to just know? want to say, you know, in India we have something called professional monas. I don't know if you heard of it or not. What, what there is it? Professional monas. So if somebody's death happens, you'll hire somebody to moan for you. No, so you'll hire women to moan <laughs> for you. So they'll come to your house and they will hit themselves. They'll cry. They'll create that, uh, you know, there's a, nice, there's a book by Veena Das and there's a very nice anthropological work done upon them in that sense. You know, so you'll hire them, they'll come to your house, they will cry, they'll hit themselves and break their bangles and stuff. And then they'll go back to their homes and they'll live the normal life and you pay them. And that that process of mourning seems to be yeah. done when that, you know, so in a village, when somebody dies, you know that those women will come over there. They will play the ritual out there. There's no money interaction in that direct sense over there. They will be fed and stuff. But that the ritual will be sort of realized and they will go back home. They, they live their normal lives. It's not that they're personally investing themselves. But the ritual is structured in a manner where the mourning work is being done by the community such that the death can be taken into account. A delegated mourning. You know, and... Like and kind it, of laughter. In a way. And, and it's been going on for many years. Many villages still have it. <laughs> you know? So what else to think, think but, about? Yeah, please I like, I like, I, no, I like what you're saying, Chitan, and especially now Mika's making this connection with canned laughter, because Zizek has a, a nice point about canned laughter that yeah, it comes the, from the laughter lasts for yeah. you. Like it does the work. 
yeah like, like there's this. a really really good good point also to, to connect this from leaders book I, I mean i don't remember it well i mean Ines can recite it better but probably do you want to go yeah um i mean sure like in connection to precisely this like professional borders this is by the way something that used to be a big thing in finland also um but really? not anymore because it, yeah it's yeah, it's called like it, it just, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it has vanished into into history, but it used to be a big thing. And this is also something that leader uh, elaborates on quite a lot in the book, like how these sort of um, social collective mourning rituals have basically like uh, slowly evaporated um, in, in in the in the Western world at least, and. Uh, particularly things like um like official morning time like uh, back in the day you used to maybe like wear black for for like months or some specific amount of time which was also always a a sign for other people that this is a time of of morning and and it was also a way for other people to process their own uh, own losses through these sort of like uh, signs of mourning that are on display for everyone so this is a it's a it's a big big subject definitely these these public mourning rituals i just want to say which is why i was saying that there's something of the stake of melancholia stake in all mourning because that is why mm. you have these rituals else you wouldn't have them in that sense because there's a, there's a threat of melancholia attached in almost all um you know the um, uh, crisis of mourning in, in, in some senses. I remember uh, yeah. uh, Agam, uh, Agamemnon having a book called State of Exception. Yeah. Uh, no, no, go on. Was, I was, no, no, I didn't want to say anything. I was just yeah, yeah. Um, and There's a book by uh, Agamemnon called State of Exception where he's discussing this problem of when the king dies. And they, they, you know, they, they, at, at a certain point when the king would die, the whole city has to mourn or the whole kingdom has to mourn together. And you know what he calls the youth titium in that sense, a gap opens up at that moment, you know, in that mm -hmm. moment where they, they can be complete free freedom for violence also, complete freedom for festival also, you know, and all of those things open up in that, in, in that gap. Okay. And so then, you a, that gap, yeah. then you yeah. stitch that gap back again in, in some senses, mm -hmm. you know, through the process of mourning in some, in, in, in that, in that, in, in, in that manner. And process of mourning can involve many different things in different moments of time and different, um, you know, and melancholia becomes that point when you can't stitch that cap back again. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. That there's no way to find the next king and that 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 that, that line to you know. So, so there is like a gap in a way from from our current point of view in the super ego injunction to enjoy. You know, there there is a gap or space is made for not enjoying. So this comes valuable and it's it's quite rare in a way and and the way that people seek for psychoanalysis. Uh, when we think of the process of psychoanalysis, it's, it's sort of like the almost on, the only way that we can find this type of space for the work for mourning and for work for uh, not enjoying and work for uh, for uh, melancholia. <laughs> Um, we have lost the catalog. It's a crisis of crisis of meaning. This is a meaning crisis. Yeah, meaning crisis. <laughs> Who's in charge? Oh, where's the where's the master signifier and so on? Yeah, I, I think that the the interesting interesting thing about having externalized the work of mourning, it's. I think it's something that happens in a way also when you are externalizing the inner guilt in psychoanalysis. I mean, it's it's a place that is uh, sort of uh, like uh, sanctified for things that don't have places. It's it's an impossible work, the work of psychoanalysis. It's something that doesn't fit except that you have the formal requirements of time, of place, of money, all those things, but except for that, it's quite open what will take place. 
Yeah, but you know, so, you have to so in, in 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 a way, it's 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 also an externalization. You are external. You are doing something. It puts you on a trajectory of things. And in the ancient societies, these public displays of putting on the robe, the black robe for mourning and so on, it was a way of providing space which we don't have. Where did Tiger Tail go? I don't know. He he dropped off. He not join back. I think. Yeah. Actually, you are you are the host now, Richard. So you might find him. He might be wanting to gain entry. So you can see the list. <laughs> you are you are the host now. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to thank everybody for looking like something yeah. is going cuckoo. Thank you, Richard. My wife here is so pressing me. She wants me <laughs> to get off and help her do something. The sadistic super ego, my wife. So I thank you all. And I thank Adele thank you. for a wonderful uh, experience. And I hope to do it again sometime. And mm -hmm. there's an echo going on. And the, 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 there's a disintegration of the technology. So <laughs> thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. I hope to see you all again. And I'm, I'm an expert on Indian culture, by the way. I'll tell you what I know next time. <laughs> OK. <laughs> we we'll love to hear you. <laughs> you don't need a super ego in India. Your father will take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it to you. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we're quitting. Bye. Bye, bye, Mika. Yeah, bye.